everybody. Welcome to the J3U podcast. I'm your host, John Jewett. With me is Luke Miller. And today we have Sam Miller on the podcast. He's the founder of the Metabolism School. And Sam has a, a lot of great functional uh, application to clients solving problems. And we want to have him on to jump into kind of the whole gut thyroid axis and what we see in females with what might be termed as weight loss, fat loss, resistance, and how we kind of break down these problems. So we're going to chat with Sam and get into this topic. Sam, thanks so much for coming on. I appreciate you having me guys. And uh, just for the listeners, no relation to Luke Miller, although we just, we both ended up with like witness protection names, unfortunately, <laughs> um, but I'm happy to be here and, you know, always love chatting about this stuff. I think it's an issue that we're seeing pop up a lot more with clients in practice and, you know, coaches need to understand how to deal with some of these signs and symptoms as they present so that the issues don't get worse. And, you know, people can actually hit their, you know, health, fitness, fat loss, physique goals. Yeah. And I think a lot of, a lot of it too, is with the identification of it as well. Like knowing that that problem could be there. It was like getting those right steps started just with the understanding of what are we actually looking for in a lot of this as well. What is your yeah. main uh, client base, Sam? So I initially started out and just had, uh, I did have lifestyle clients and some athletes. And then over time, my one-on-one -on -one client roster shifted to being more coaches. So the initial idea for kind of my mentorship program, which then became kind of my specialization program, which all sort of fall under, you know, that umbrella that you mentioned, metabolism school. The main program we run is the functional nutrition and metabolism specialization. It's a 16 week program for coaches. It's live plus additional modules and education. So right now, um, you know, like 99% of my clients are coaches, but when I was first starting out, you know, I worked in campus recreation setting where I was working with professors, students, athletes. Um, I also, you know, I've worked at random nutrition stores, I had my own like kind of personal training practice and also trained at other gyms where I had a lot of lifestyle clients as well. Um, and throughout that time period, I'd say typically tipped in, in the favor of female population, a little bit over 50%, but typically always had both male and female clients. It was probably around 2017 where a significant portion of my one-on-one -on -one roster started to become nutrition coaches and personal trainers. And at that point is kind of when I saw the need for the education that we provide in terms of our program. And so from that point forward, it's consistently been like over 50% coaches. And a lot of that would be, you know, female coaches and working on female client cases, you know, specific to those issues and transformation, whether it's, you know, metabol metabolic adaptation, hormonal dysregulation, gut health, um, you know, even mood related but those are some big, uh, big things we see PCOS, perimenopause, stuff like that. So certainly have, have definitely had experience both on the lifestyle and athlete side. And once you begin to understand just kind of full body systems and how things work from a physiological perspective, it's like, there are dish, just different stressors that people experience or different stimulus that may be going into it. And sometimes, you know, obviously on the athlete side, you have uh, pharmacology and performance enhancing drugs, but if you can understand kind of the base workings of the system, a lot of the time solving the problems, it's like the way that you think about it, you're still using kind of similar frameworks and approaches. It's just how that's scaled. You know, maybe for an athlete, there's more food involved, which may pose some, some issues that, you know, from a digestion perspective, maybe if the lifestyle client, the stressor is a little bit different than maybe the person that's like the full-time uh, bodybuilder. And that's just kind of their, their day job. So I think there's different challenges that, that come with, all of those cases, but once you really understand sort of the, the fundamental science that goes into it, I think, um, you know, there are good coaches that can really kind of weave in and out of those different topics and still, you know, be fairly impactful uh, in terms of how they're able to help people. Yeah, I ask because, you know, a lot of, a lot of people are listening are going to be competitors primarily, but these issues are ones that span across all types of different clientele from just your gin pop to someone that's uh, Olympia level competitor. And like you said, it could be slight different stressors driving the issue, but some of these root issues are relatively the same, whether you're yeah competitor or even lifestyle. And what I wanted to dive into with mainly being female focused is that what are you seeing is because going back to gut thyroid being kind of what you're addressing, but on, on the front end, like when a client's coming to you, what are the main issues that are presenting that then become, Hey, we're solving these issues as, as issues. So I guess what, 
what are the, the clients realizing? Is it some type of, hey, I've been trying to lose weight forever. I'm not seeing that happen. Is it uh, some, something else that you're seeing? Yeah. So I, I think we just have to zoom out to like, okay, where do we typically start with a client when they come in and then their complaints? So a lot of what you're mentioning is biofeedback, symptomology, things of that nature. So I always like to have at least a seven day food log on any client, whether they're an athlete or lifestyle client. I think that's super important to have some form of like food journal in place so you can see, okay, are we maintaining our weight at this current intake? If it's a lifestyle client and they're not as familiar with tracking, we obviously need to provide some education there in terms of how that's done or just say, hey, do this old fashioned way, write it on paper. Like, I want to know what you're eating. Let me know. Um, and for biofeedback, I use shreds, which is sleep, hunger, recovery, energy, digestion, and stress. So I have them do a quantitative scoring system and qualitative. So I want to know subjectively how you feel. Like, did you wake up? Do you feel well rested? But then also, you know, we're going to explore like, okay, number of hours in bed. Um, if they have an aura ring or whoop or anything like that, we can add additional sort of metrics on top of it, even though, um, you know, that may not be perfect, but it's still giving us a data point to look at. So my first step is kind of thorough intake form, which I include biofeedback as part of that intake form, the food log. And so when I'm seeing someone kind of unpack the, those symptoms or mention what they're struggling with. Usually when there's thyroid and gut health related stuff, it could be low energy, brain fog, you know, cognitive difficulties or inability to kind of concentrate on tasks, um, fatigue. If the gut issues are pretty bad, we may have some sleep dis disturbances. And also with thyroid, if there's hypothyroid, we often see constipation and motility issues, which can then lead to kind of a cascade of other problems on top of that. Um, and also with, with kind of gut and thyroid together, typically it is going hand in hand with some form of adrenal component or stress. So oftentimes in their biofeedback, they may be mentioning like, Hey, you know, I have work stress or relationship stress, or there's something else that's kind of going on, on top of, um, the food situation, weight loss resistance is definitely something, or maybe they're struggling. Um, and then for thyroid, this could be separate from gut health issues, but can go hand in hand is, you know, cold extremities, you know, having a hard time kind of warming up your appendages or, you know, just having a difficulty like maintaining that body heat since thyroid is a very key energy regulator and obviously plays a key role in terms of um, overall that that body heat and ability to maintain that temperature. So if I were to work with a female client who's maybe intermediate level or even an athlete listening to this, I might also observe it through their morning basal body temperature. So if they were to take an oral thermometer and check their temperature in the morning, I'm going to see a decline in body temperature. So usually as they come in, I've got that intake form. I'm unpacking those symptoms, kind of looking at the food log maybe, uh, you know, some patterns in terms of bowel movements and digestion. And then, you know, if I had any additional metrics, it could be something like body temperature on top of that. And they might just report like, Hey, it's summertime. And I, I wear a sweatshirt, you know, here and there, or just things that may be not be typical, uh, of your average sort of, uh, active population or active client. So I'd say those are some of the biggest ones that I see regularly. That's great. And I think that's some good takeaway for coaches is that like an accurate yeah. prescription, has to start with an accurate assessment. So you need on all your intake forms to be adequately being able to go through all the biofeedback, but also more objective measures too, to come up with leading to that point of maybe this could be gut and thyroid related. Now, the gut and thyroid, it's gut health has been kind of a hot topic. And I feel like everyone wants that magic unicorn of, oh man, that's my problem. That's why I can't lose fat and get lean. And a lot of times it's like, well, no, this could just be like in their food log, maybe they're just not accurately tracking. And we know with, you know, going through metabolic adaptation and prep, it's not that much adaptation. Usually it's lowering of meat or they're just not accurately tracking output or input. And those are really the issues of weight loss resistance. So um, maybe for your side, do you see increased of actual true like gut thyroid issues this is the rarity that's you're seeing like what is the actual prevalence um maybe maybe it's a, a bit more biased in your in your clinic because i think it depends because i might have stage now where i think both coaches and clients do find themselves in like my social media sphere or instagram bubble and so therefore they're aware that i've dealt with some of that stuff so then they're coming to me with it which creates an unrealistic representation of, you know, I understand if we were to look at the United States as a whole, our issue is insulin resistance, standard American diet, you know, lack of movement, sedentary lifestyle, stress management, you know, we just need to get people resistance training three days a week, go for a walk, like 
period. Within the fitness industry, we do have a chronic dieting culture and some some issues within fitness, especially with the female population that does predispose them to some gut, gut thyroid issues. And there are certain times in your life uh, where that can be exacerbated. Maybe it's a female who had a C-section and was on heavy antibiotics after giving birth to a child. Maybe it was po you know, postpartum, perimenopause, uh, maybe some form of trauma in life uh, that you know put them at like autoimmune risk and they had a hereditary disp disposition, predisposition to that, excuse me. And that's kind of where everything's coming together. Now, does everyone have that? No, but within the health and fitness industry, could you see one in five or one in six clients in a diet industry already within that bubble have those issues? Yes, I think that's realistic. If we were to look at like the US population as a whole, certainly not everybody is over dieted and training, you know, five plus days a week. That's just not what's going on realistically. But I think within pockets of the population, certain people's lifestyle behaviors. Uh, and I also think with our kind of macro hacks and volumetrics around chronic dieting and putting cauliflower rice in the oatmeal and different things that people are doing, they might not also be, you know, eating in a way that supports optimal digestion. So I think it's both. It's yes, there is the metabolic adaptation component, which most of those with adequate nutritional periodization, those changes are just transient. And that's where like the value of your intake form, biofeedback and labs, you can identify, okay, is this something based on, you know, a, a shorter period of a dietary intervention, which usually when we see those changes, for example, in free T3, probably based on the depth duration and frequency of your diet phases. If you diet very frequently, if you subtract calories, like the depth at which you subtract those calories, you cut hard, um, that, that is going to make a difference. And then uh, as far as the duration, okay, we have, you know, Sally who diets every eight weeks versus, okay, Brenda decided to go on, you know, she's basically been trying to diet since like the last time the bears won the Super Bowl. So like she has no reverse diet, nutritional periodization, et cetera. So those issues are going to manifest a little bit differently in terms of what we're seeing in biofeedback and in labs, uh, and also cause different issues related to adherence and like what we ultimately need in the client protocol. So that's why, yes, you are looking at biofeedback and that food log coming in, but an easy way for, you know, competitors or coaches to remember this is just to get a pulse on the transformation. So the first part is kind of that uh, physical goals and objectives, understanding key motivators. L is going to be their actual lifestyle. So who cooks the meals, who's going to the store, um, you know, how often are they trained? Like all those lifestyle components, do you travel for work? What's your sleep like? Um, social jet lags, so people going out on the weekends, they party all all the time, Friday, Saturday, Sunday versus being consistent. S is your shreds. So that biofeedback I mentioned, and then E is just expectations, which if you're working with a coach, I think that communication and having clear expectations of the relationship is super important. So usually through their lifestyle, I can unpack what type of potential issue it is on the gut side or thyroid. Now, if you're an executive and you travel for work, you're on planes all the time, you're eating out of airports, you know, maybe your digestive issues are completely different than the competitor who she's been under 1400 calories. She's doing, you know, AM cardio post-workout, you know, post-lift cardio, you know, maybe heavy stims involved in that situation, high caffeine, maybe other performance enhancing drugs, uh, other things, putting her in sympathetic dominance. And then, you know, she's trying to macro hack her way to like hitting those 1400 calories because her appetite is just you know, high with that training volume. And so she's making choices that aren't necessarily the easiest to digest and that over time will compound. And so then you'll see, you know, this otherwise what was fairly healthy, you know, 26 year old female who now has what looks like subclinical hypothyroid, some things that are presenting like a small intestinal bacteria overgrowth, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it's like how we got there could be very different, different than like the perimenopausal woman who's a non-competitor, uh, but they're still presenting with maybe digestive issues, difficulty losing weight or recomping now, you know, may or may not have those body temperature related changes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we can unpack it different ways and kind of how it unfolds. Uh, but the main idea, the way I look at, you know, whether it's thyroid, adrenals, reproductive hormones, from a metabolism perspective, when we look at a high level, you know, what is metabolism really doing? It is regulating energy essentially for survival. And we have to be mindful of imminent, you know, stressors, right? Which could be related to our perceived stress, could be inflammation in the body. Um, you know, it could be related to that circadian sort of hygiene I mentioned. Uh, we talked about inflammation, insulin resistance, all of those things are stressors. So at the end of the day, when you look at metabolism a little bit more like that kind of stress barometer, but also being this sort of uh, thermostat and, and 
miser of energy intake makes a lot more sense as to why we have these adaptations. So explaining adaptive physiology from that perspective, a lot of these thyroid issues, gut issues, it's really an adaptive condition that's been developed based on that prior stimulus from the person's lifestyle. And that can apply to the lifestyle client or, you know, the athlete. And it's just kind of what, uh, you know, there's a weak point in the chain or weak link in the chain that typically will kind of uh, eventually that kind of breaks. And then that's where these people tend to really not feel good. And we got to figure out reverse engineer. Okay. What was that problem? you know, get back on top of things. So, uh, you know, with that competitor example, low energy availability, high stress, you know, maybe they don't have a ton of lifestyle stress, but like training can still be a stressor, even though exercise is kind of hormesis beneficial in a way. Um, if you're not recovering properly, you know, that can be an issue. And, you know, we mentioned high caffeine, sympathetic activation, maybe your sleep's not very good. And then we're kind of setting up this, uh, you know, cascade that can lead to issues down the road, if not managed. And that's where I think the power of a coach is right. Is like, you know, understanding whether it's John, Luke, you know, myself, how to kind of unpack that and properly manage that stimulus along with the appropriate recovery. So we don't end up with these issues or implementing something like kind of nutritional periodization to alleviate some of that adaptation that uh, John mentioned earlier. Yeah, I think you had some great points there. And like my point of, uh, you know, having with, you know, the, populations is you have some evidence practitioners that look to only research and I don't think they're in the trench enough to where they say, oh, here's the prevalence of SIBO or IBS. Um, and, and very, very well so that is like the evidence. But I think within like, say the competitor realm, we're fairly underrepresented in research to say like, what is the prevalence of certain things we're running into? Yeah, as practitioners, we absolutely see those things occurring. And so within that competitor realm, you, you do have a lot of exposure to like you're saying to basically the perfect storm to end up with. Yeah, I, did, I actually did a podcast. It aired last Wednesday or Friday. Uh, obviously I'm not sure when you guys are going to air this episode live, but I called it the perfect storm client case. And it's basically wow. where hormonal dysregulation and gut issues collide. And a lot of times it's like the bikini competitor who's like six to 12 months post-birth control who's like been in a deficit, maybe tried to reverse at some point, but now isn't as insulin sensitive as she was before high stress, you know, maybe wants to go on a mini cut because she's not happy with her body composition, um, having some gut issues, but doesn't really understand the extent of those gut issues is in like a low T, um, probably not ovulating because we never really fully recovered that cycle because we didn't prioritize reproductive health because they were competing at the time that they were on birth control, whatever the case may be. So a lot of times you do kind of have these issues collide. And I think there's unique stressors that occur related to competing and the extent to which you're subtracting food. And then also just depending on the pharmacology involved, it's like, yeah, we don't have a great randomized controlled trial on 50, 30 year old, you know, bikini oh, physique yeah. figure yeah. editors who are, you know, utilizing X, Y, Z, you know, performance enhancement and doing this type of training. <laughs> and then, you know, also trying to live their life and, and doing a number of other things. So it is. It is, you have to use the research more as kind of a guiding sort of frame of how you might look at a problem, but you still need to be able to, that's why I'm so big on teaching more critical thinking, problem solving and frameworks. I think you can do a lot with methodologies, frameworks and understanding how to proceed through a problem or client case, but far too many people are like, well, in this study, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, okay, well, does that actually translate to the client population you're working with? And so the best way I've, I've really thought of how to depict this visually for anyone listening to the podcast is a lot of times, like the best coaching happens when we have the intersection of three circles or essentially a Venn diagram, we have, you know, the research base and evidence. So we know that, Hey, this has been like tried on humans. Like this is uh, something potentially that could be a viable intervention. We know that clients end of one experience, which is like, as an individual, as a human being, everybody has sort of a unique health history, unique training, you know, their background, the diets they've followed, um, you know, their genetics, things like that, that we're going to consider. And then also we have to consider our coaching experience. Have I seen a case like this before? How has this played out? What has this been like in the trenches? What's my relationship like with this client? And then depending on the intersection of those three circles, maybe I'm going to pull one idea from the research, but I know that based on what was done in that research and these you know, this client's personal preferences, maybe that doesn't really work for him or her. And then, you know, I also have my coaching experience where I'm like, Hey, I know that if we push this for X amount of time, I've seen this play out before. 
and you kind of get that like gut feeling that you got to go a little bit of a different direction. So I think it's a mix of kind of like that critical thinking and problem solving a little bit of intuition, but then also, you know, using the evidence base in a way that you're trying to be as responsible and conscious for your clients as possible and, and guiding them in the best way possible, but also understanding that like, usually a lot of that research lags behind, which actually going on in terms of solving problems in real life. Um, so you can't, you're not always going to have the perfect PubMed ID to substantiate the you know decisions that you're making in your client check-in, which I think for some people's tr- tough when they're like perfectionists uh, and you have to be willing to, you know, you go to the client, say, Hey, this is how I've seen this play out before. These are some ideas I have, like, this is, you know, you've kind of mentioned this, this, and this, how do you feel about maybe trying this? Like, is that something that sounds, you know, like something you could potentially stick with open to trying it? Cool. And then, you know, you give it a shot and then you have that real time feedback and that's where the communication and check-ins come in. It's the difference between coaching and, you know, solely just like doing research. Yeah, I think, go ahead. Well, I think one of the most valuable pieces there is like, just like kind of bringing up the, the classic case, right. Is like, kind of bringing it back to the GI problems within females is that what is the number one thing we see is like some sort of hypothalamic adaptation that can a lot of times lead to that GI disturbance that may be now creating another chronic or perfect storm for furthering of that chronic condition, right? And right. knowing the intersection of all of these variables allows us to pinpoint maybe not even the only the one variable that's driving that problem um, where we can now start to bring in not only our own solutions, but practitioners as well as needed in order to get solutions driven for those hypothalamic adaptations that we are seeing, whether it be, you know, just even in those like larger female classes, WPD and figure where drug use has been pretty high and it's pushed these females pretty much into a menopausal state. It's like, there's a baseline environment there that's not created just because of that past history that is not going to be represented pretty much in a lot of uh, other populations. And so yeah, for um, sure. it's important to kind of take that. And then that's why I like, I really like the critical thinking intersection of the variables part, because as coaches, like the intake portion is probably where the most valuable portion of the experience is for the client. Yeah. And obviously I'm sure you guys are a big proponent of if someone's in figure of women's physique and you're not running labs, Oh, yeah. really frequently like that just I don't know I mean obviously I follow your content a little bit but as far as where you guys stand on that I just don't know that there should be figure and physique competitors who are you know especially trying to utilize any type of performance enhancement if they're not keeping a baseline or pulse on those labs or understanding like hey maybe I'm a candidate for HRT and ending up in that menopausal state obviously that presents long-term health risks both you know, in terms of um, if they're crashing, you know, estrogen in terms of cardiovascular health, bone density, you know, it's not just, and, you know, neurological health, you know, it's not just, okay, the show that's right now, but also looking across the decades in their lifespan and how to kind of ameliorate the fact that it's like, cool, you love this sport, let's have you compete. But at the same time, let's get some blood work done, both, you know, on off cycle and throughout that process. I think to speak to Luke's point about the, hypothalamic or basically HPA dysfunction, right? A lot of times it, we're really just unpacking the type of stress, whether that's, okay, you were on an exogenous hormone that is suppressing the system somewhat, um, or, or essentially getting some form of shutdown and maybe you're not ovulating as a result of that, um, especially use of androgens and things of that nature. For women, it's tough, right? Because in a hyperandrogenic state, that can also potentially exacerbate gut dysbiosis. Like this really just turns into a vicious cycle of, you know, um, we can have inflammation that potentially pushes like 5 alpha reductase more. We end up with higher DHT, get hyperandro- hyperandrogenism in those symptoms. Those high androgens can potentially make the dysbiosis work. The worse the dysbiosis and the inflammation can compound, you know, we could have, uh, and then depending on their state of prep and leanness, other things, you know, insulin resistance can also be at play here. So definitely can have, uh, you know, that figure and physique population, definitely um, unique sort of circumstances there in terms of the level of scrutiny and attention to detail and care, and also understanding the role of, you know, different types of performance enhancement, even seasons to that as well, um, to mitigate some of those issues there, because otherwise it's almost like, you know, to use a lifestyle client example, right. In the PCOS 
female, okay, if we have any type of insulin resistance that's driving this disproportionate relationship or imbalance between LH and FSH, that exacerbates the high androgen problem. You know, the high androgens in terms of just LH leading to more testosterone, we also have that insulin resistance and inflammation pushing 5 alpha reductase. We end up with more DHT. And, you know, that's exacerbating the PCOS symptoms as well. So we can see this in lifestyle clients. You can also see it play out uh, with those competitors as well. Um, a lot of GI issues though. I mean, I think it's part of it's the food choices, but some of it is, you know, I think stress is a key driver there. Um, even all the way up from an HPA perspective, starting at the level of the hypothalamus and pituitary, that, uh, you know, consistent sort of release and triggered that fight or flight response, sympathetic activation, CRH will, you know, have some consequences in terms of intestinal permeability, intestinal permeability, we result in potential immune activation. That's going to be problematic, especially for women who are maybe predisposed to autoimmunity or Hashimoto's. So, you know, if we had to come to like kind of one key thing, stress is key, but there's also some basics with your gut health too, right? Like chewing your meals, attentive eating, you know, maybe go for a walk after your meals, you know, promote digestion, also get that postprandial glucose regulation. So as far as like basic nutritional keystones, I think a lot of it is just, you know, in our society, modern world, things being a little bit more fast paced, um, you know, slowing down, chewing your food, picking things that actually, you know, sit well with you from a digestive perspective, considering things like post-meal walks. Um, I mentioned attentive eating before, but all of those are really big and also figuring out your unique sort of threshold from a fiber perspective, because not everybody responds the same, um, you know, from like, especially in terms of plant matter, different carbohydrates and things like that. So I think that's where looking at the food log, you can begin to identify common irritants or issues that people have uh, and make some practical changes as a nutrition coach. Uh, but one of those key things, themes that, that Luke sort of mentioned is stress. And part of the compounding effect of that HPA axis activation is going to be one, um, you know, consequences of intestinal permeability or dysbiosis. So essentially we have more opportunistic bacteria and a little bit less commensal in terms of that ratio or kind of good guys, bad guys. And we're also seeing with that high stress that can impact thyroid conversion. So we're ending up with a little bit less of that metabolically active free T3, um, which is very important if you are trying to recomp or lose body fat or have any sort of positive physique changes, uh, definitely important. So even bringing it back to just kind of where Luke was, HPA axis activation, I look at that as kind of multifaceted um, or there's there's multiple prongs to the issues here, right? The first is, okay, what what consequence is there when we have stress? and that sympathetic activation on actual downstream thyroid and, and hormones. And then also what's going on in terms of the gut itself. And then as that gut environment is created as a result of that stress, what ramifications does that have in terms of further exacerbating the thyroid conversion beyond the stress itself? Because first, the stress is going to impact what's going on in terms of potentially free T3 and reverse T3. And then if the gut issues continue to get worse and there's gut inflammation, dysbiosis, and tussle permeability, obviously that deiodinase function, which is basically the enzyme. So anytime you hear ASE, basically that D is to cleave or remove, that deiodinase is removing an iodine molecule from T4, we're going to end up with less of that metabolically active free T3. Now we've got that gut issue that we kind of mentioned earlier. And with less free T3, that can potentially, when folks start to slide down that scale, end up with, you know, that's where sometimes we see that impaired motility, constipation, and then that's where we start to see some issues with estrogen metabolism as well. So kind of a big picture, those would be like three or four of the key things that I would be looking at coming back to kind of that HPA axis function, as well as gut function and, you know, downstream consequences in terms of the thyroid. Yeah, that's perfect. I was, I know we were, we were jumping down some tunnels and I wanted to scope out and get back to like our, the gut thyroid. Original, and, yeah. Our original yeah. topic of the podcast before we ended up down seven different <laughs> rabbit holes. Yeah. Just, just for everyone. It's all connected know. though. It's hard to, it you know, it's hard to have a conversation about one without being like, yeah, but also what about this? So yeah. it's, it's the, the link between all three and the, the, the arrow moves both ways, right? So the thyroid affects the gut, gut affects thyroid, the HPTO axis affects the gut and thyroid and they all kind of go around. So you might have one driver that could be affecting one more than other, but they all affect each other downstream. But what you're talking about, Sam, is that there is a systemic driver as well. And what you're finding, it's a lot of stress. Uh, this could be driven with lack of sleep, 
And then you're also seeing like maybe nutrition deficiencies that are occurring, fiber deficiencies. Yeah, for sure. And all, all these accumulation of things are affecting all these things in the system. And what you see as a coach might be one more than other. Maybe it's gut more than thyroid or HPTO more than the gut, for instance. So bringing this back to, we, I know we talked a little bit about what, what do you do now, right? So, yeah, yeah. That's a great example. And I think just for a helpful reminder for folks at home and to kind of simplify this is anytime we have less than optimal health from a gut health perspective, right? Microbiome is maybe not in an optimal state. We're, we're not going to have ideal micronutrient absorption. They have a very symbiotic relationship. Healthy gut helps to facilitate the uptake of micronutrients. And if we have impaired micronutrient status, that also impacts the gut. So it's, it's just as John mentioned in terms of connection between these full body systems and adrenals and thyroid, et cetera. Well, guess what? If you're constantly under stress, you are probably depleting certain key micronutrients as a result of that stress. Uh, you know, that has consequences for your gut health as well. Um, and then it adds insult to injury. And that's where we end up in these sort of vicious cycles. So depending on where the issue is stemming from, I do think micronutrient support is a great place to kind of start um, from really adrenal, thyroid, and gut, because in all three of those circumstances, we need to kind of look and evaluate. So if I have that seven-day food log, and let's say their selenium intake sucks, it's like lackluster. Well, let's potentially look there, you know, what's going on with zinc. Um, you know, I will check, check other vitamins and minerals as well, and just kind of begin that analysis with the food log. Uh, and that's where chronometer can be really great. Instead of just my fitness pal is going a little bit layer deeper on that seven day food log. Um, we'll also, if we do have any type of labs can potentially use a combination of, you know, not only your hormonal panel, but also using your CBC and CMP to identify, um, potential issues there. So I'm definitely going to look at food and micronutrition always. Lifestyle is key. So as John that, mentioned- Sam, just before you go in about nutrition, yeah. um, are you coming across certain maybe nutrition dogma that you see in competitors that um, maybe should be done in a different way nutrition programming wise, like for certain, certain trends, like not use, using sea salt that's not iodized or um, only prepping on chicken rice and ways that to like, if for this competitor, they look in their diet, like what are some standouts of things that you think should be in place um, as more of a prophylactic to keep good gut health and hormone function? Yeah. I mean, the, you know, the fish and green vegetable, chicken and green vegetable, that does scare me a little bit in terms of nutritional variety, micronutrition. I mean, I was brought in on a Kate, I don't know if it was two years ago or about a year ago at this point. And this individual is already very lean. She looked very solid, but definitely was showing some iron deficiency, anemia, different micronutrient deficiencies, uh, very, very sky high inflammation, as well as insulin scores on her fasting insulin. And, you know, just making a few changes and substitutions in her meals dropped about eight pounds in a matter of, you know, a few days to a week's time. It was definitely less than seven to 10 days time. And that was pulling, you know, pulling training and a number of things, obviously inflammations at play there. But I think one of my pet peeves, or if you were saying like, okay, what's a more proactive way to approach this? You know, I think when you're going to solely just like chicken and turkey or just fish, or you're having green beans or broccoli as like your only sources of vegetables, uh, or you're having zero fruit and only, I'm only having rice or I'm only having oats. And a lot of people do, you know, I was that person when I competed, I was like, well, oats are more filling. So I'm going to eat more, more oats. So this diet's less miserable and I can make them taste good. And the problem there is as much as it does appease your immediate need and there's instant gratification there from like a appetite suppression perspective, there can be health consequences of, okay, meal one is X, meal two is Y, meal three is X, meal four is Y. And I totally understand from an adherence and consistency perspective and for the purpose of getting to the finish line, Simplicity can be important. However, I think a little bit of rotation, assuming you're measuring appropriately and you're tracking things, um, you know, even including like for this particular person, we swapped a green vegetable for a different green vegetable, added some like red bell pepper, still relatively low in carbohydrate, but um, helped her with some vitamin C as well as, you know, just kind of, you know, getting some colorful ingredients in there. Um, and she was still able to handle that from a dig digestive perspective. You could switch like a lean chicken or turkey to like a venison, you know, if you can afford to do venison or grass fed beef or bison um, and account, you know, go with leaner cuts or account for your dietary fat, because I see a lot of competitors where it's like, 
okay, peanut butter is their main fat source, you know, because it tastes good. And unfortunately, that's just not providing the same micronutrition as a whole egg, you know, a lean cut of, you know, grass-fed beef or, you know, the list goes on. So I definitely feel like, you know, those would be some of my nutritional pet peeves. And it is, it is hard to execute that, but also sitting down when you're tired of chicken, you're going to really look forward to that steak meal or that, you know, grass-fed ground bison meal. You know, it's going to taste better in terms of your overall preparation and stuff. Plus you're getting, you know, uh, highly bioavailable iron, you know, you're getting B vitamins, uh, different essential amino acid profile. Like there's so many benefits from a nutritional perspective. So that's something that, if you can, like, if you still have any, you know, fats in the diet and, you know, we're not like in that last, like really, really heavy push. I mean, I even see that in terms of lifestyle clients because they're modeling a lot of the behaviors of what they see in their favorite fitness influencers and competitors when they're trying to get lean. So I think it does start, you know, I think a lot of things are uh, played around with, experimented with, and, you know, led with bodybuilding and physique sports because a lot of those folks are coaches and then implementing that with lifestyle clients down the road, if that makes sense. So as far as like prophylactic approach, I think there's micronutrition support, especially if you are um, competing and under stress, but also that goes for lifestyle clients too. If you're training about as much as a competitor, even if you're not stepping on stage, please consider supplementing intelligently. Uh, and then some of those nutrition substitutions in terms of your lean protein sources, um, you know, even including you know, the occasional, if, if you're going to have half a tablespoon of nut butter at that meal, you can't tell me you couldn't make a substitution to occasionally include like a 90 something percent lean protein source or a whole egg or something to provide choline and vitamin D and other essential nutrients as well. Um, so that's just kind of my, as my nutritional philosophies has evolved, have evolved, I definitely look more at the digestion and micronutrition perspective than I did before five or 10 years ago, just because as I've seen it play out, um, can have pretty intense ramifications, not just in terms of someone's overall appearance between progress photos, but also how they feel their quality of life. And when you're actually looking at, uh, you know, their physiology on paper in terms of like a serum lab, it can make a pretty significant difference in terms of their overall health markers, inflammation and nutrient status. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I used to do the preps of chicken rice, beef rice, and that just gets you there and you're starving on the show, but that's what you're told to do. Um, yeah. So, you know, I've, I've had- and I've been there too. I mean, I was like <laughs> a few weeks out with an upper respiratory infection being told to have like, you know, that lean, you know, chicken or turkey, and then, you know, either rice or oats, and then, you know, switch, you know, in whatever meal, maybe have egg whites and kind of flip it back and forth with like a teaspoon of fats here or there. I was like, dude, I don't even want the teaspoon of fat because it just makes me want more food. Like just take it, take it out at that point. Um, but yeah, it, it just depends on, I, you know, I was fortunate after, you know, that period of time in my life to work with other coaches in more of the bodybuilding realm, like John Meadows, who was a little bit bigger on some of those different foods um, and other folks, not that, you know, he obviously had his Arnold prep where I'm pretty sure he ate like egg whites and tuna and ketchup to cruise into that show. But, you know, there, as far as from a lifestyle client perspective, he wasn't necessarily implementing that or recommending that for someone other than himself uh, in terms of getting, getting on stage there. So I've definitely seen different perspectives. And that's something if you're listening, if you haven't had a coach for yourself, a variety of coaches to see different sort of ways of doing things and opinions, this is kind of just a shout out to the coaches out there just to you know, consider looking into it versus the way that you're currently doing things. Cause the way that I've evolved, I think I got my first certification when I was 17 years old. I do things completely differently. Now I'm going on 34. Um, so having that much time, you know, in the trenches, you see like, oh, wow, I did that that way. And that was really stupid. If I could go back and change that, yeah. I, you know, I would have done X, yeah. Y, and Z and so much better. So hindsight's always 2020, but I think people don't always make the connections to the conversation we're having around nutrition, food logs, micronutrition to a lot of the issues that Luke was asking about. And the reason this is so important is because, um, you know, the food we put into our mouth impacts our microbiome, you know, obviously fiber makes a difference. Um, and well, just all food makes a different supplementation. You put supplements in your body that that can impact the microbiome as well. Uh, but when you end up in this inflammatory state and you're also undernourished, uh, both from a caloric perspective and a micronutrition perspective, it just adds insult to injury in terms of your performance and, uh, how you feel. And ultimately if, if that goes on long enough, it will impact how you look, uh, unfortunately. So, yeah. So, so I mean, that's, that's a great takeaway is for like the nutrition aspect. And I know you're about to jump into, okay, we have lifestyle, stress, sleep, 
to be addressing for this individual as well. So what are you having like the main, the main takeaway points that you're saying, and we can use this competitor example if you want uh, if, to go down that yeah, route. Yeah, or I mean, I think whether it's a competitor or a lifestyle, right? Like if you're having any digestive issues, I, I really think, because I've been in this boat myself, I actually had some pretty bad, uh, part of the reason I ended up gaining knowledge on some of this stuff is my own personal health journey, which first started more on kind of the endocrine side, and then later branched into after competing had a lot of GI issues, which led to my re-education about gut stuff. So I think postprandial walks, both from a glucose regulation perspective and me, I mean, we have, this is an example, right? Where we can see this in coaching and clinical practice, but also there's research and evidence to support head to head prokinetic medication versus a walk after your meal for five to 10 minutes, head to head, the walking is basically just as good. So rather than take that me medication, go for a short little walk after your meal, especially your bigger meals. If you can, um, I've got three dogs, so I'm doing plenty of dog walking <laughs> here and there to get that in after meals. Um, I think that's huge. And then just in terms of sleep hygiene, uh, trying to keep that same sleep wake cycle, if you can getting morning sunlight, um, you know, cutting off electronics more so I think because people tend to be a little bit more stress reactive and engage in conversations of things that maybe they shouldn't be watching right before they uh, right before they go to bed or getting like fired up about someone trolling someone on the internet. Uh, so as much as possible, you know, I think sleep is key there. That's going to help modulate inflammation, not to mention regulating your appetite. So if you are on a little bit more of an intense diet, I'm sure we've all been there where you don't sleep as well the night before that impacts your decision-making, your mood, you're hungrier. Um, so as best you can, you know, optimize sleep for performance, but also for your health. Uh, and then just over the years, it's like, I used to, I, I remember being the kid that like, I didn't count walking as like a legit physical activity, right. Or like mowing the, you know, doing something where it's like having a push mower or something and walking around. I'm like, Oh, well, well I still got to go do blah, 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 or do cardio or do whatever. And it's like, yeah, there are different, they are different stimulus, but I think people underestimate the value of non-exercise activity in terms of their total daily energy expenditure, the metabolic benefits that that has insulin sensitivity, digestion, inflammation. It's also one of the few things in life where you're actually burning a modest amount of calories, but you're also managing your stress. You're more likely in a parasympathetic state. If you can get out in nature, that's awesome too. So now we're outside, we're managing our stress, but we're also not sitting on our ass and we're burning calories. That's like a win, 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 win. So I think you can't understate the value of like sleep and walks would be a big one. And then from a stress management perspective, everybody's kind of different, right? Not everybody wants to meditate or do breath work. So it's about finding like what's best for that client. Is it music? Is it, do they like art? Are they more into like a hobby or woodworking or whatever? Or do they enjoy just going outside, sitting in nature, pets, community, you know, um, friends, loved ones, you know, there's different ways that people kind of manage their stress. So understanding your clients and what kind of makes them tick, what they enjoy, I think can go a really long way in terms of helping them in their transformation. Um, and this is for competitors or for lifestyle clients, right? I think people view it as like the competitor is like intense and on the step mill and doing, you know, only lifting. It's like, no, you guys need some of that like chill woosa like parasympathetic time as well uh equally as much as the lifestyle client uh, because we all have stressors in some form of some form or another so having the appropriate uh modalities to kind of bring you back down i think is super super important for for all clients especially if they're dealing with these gi issues adrenal issues thyroid issues yeah th those are great takeaways and how i like to prep people even myself now is try to drive a high energy flux state to where we have a lot of food in place because we're staying active and driving up meat with a balance within that, of course, you know, um, but then you have less nutrition deficiencies running into, you're also getting more fire in the diet because of that too, just being in higher food and then also better training. And so that's, yeah, that's sure. relieving it. But you, uh, one other thing to then do, to be addressing would be at some point you add in nutrition aspects, you manage sleep, stress, this person needs more than that. Like you had your client example, right? You, you put these things in, she drops weight, she keeps going in, in, into the show or this fat loss phase. But at some point, it's just not enough. And you have to do a full pullback uh, of the phase. Um, what, what does that look like? Once you really like, hey, we need to please strip training back. You're only going to train a couple days a week to manage stress. You need to pull out of this contest prep phase or fat loss phase. 
Yeah. So I would say, you know, this can vary on the degree of the gut issues. So if it's really, really bad, I mean, a person's having terrible digestion, gas, like quality of life is impacted. This is usually the person where like, they're even worried about going out to eat. They're worried about traveling. So, I mean, I'll pull training way back, uh, deload, um, and the problem is, I think with especially active clients, they just identify with the training so much that there's definitely an attachment to that level of activity. So, you know, sometimes that might look like, you know, take a week off. Other times it might be, you know, you're training two days a week and you're leaving reps in reserve. Um, if it's a mild issue, if we just have a little bit of, you know, kind of like mild subclinical hypothyroid with like, maybe your digestion could be better, but it's not awful. You know, we could probably, we might train three to four days a week and leave reps in reserve. Maybe, you know, overall volume has come down, intensity's come down a little bit, but we're training enough to kind of maintain the muscle that we have. Uh, and then using nutrition and some of those other levers to really help. And then really just depending on the person's budget, you can get creative with supplementation to address some of those deficiencies and then also gut health. Cause obviously I'm sure you guys have seen certain like functional nutrition protocols and air quotes that are like 600, $800 in terms of what people are doing in terms of their intervention. So if folks are still continuing to have those gut issues, when you've removed, like kind of going through a removal phase, picking out common irritants, trying to get them back on track, you've dropped training a little bit, you're managing stress, if they're still having a problem, you know, that's where you might consider more of a true like four hour, five hour protocol or elimination diet. And we're going a little bit further with the nutrition. And maybe you're using like an herbal antimicrobial along with maybe we're getting into the point where we have to do a little bit of like uh, GI repair, re-inoculation and, you know, eventually get to uh, some probiotics and things like that. But I mean, the mistake a lot of people make is they don't make the food adjustment first or pull back on training and they just bring, you know, like a random probiotic in and it's like bringing a super soaker to a forest fire, uh, you know, kind of like water gun showing up instead of the fire department. So that's kind of like my prefer, I like to test a little bit in terms of like, okay, is will these symptoms improve with stress alleviation, mitigation, backing down on the training, maybe a little deload. Um, maybe we're keeping the food around like kind of maintenance. We're not trying to go super deep into deficit. I think those people with gut issues, I uh, actually did a video on this the other day. If you're having digestive dysfunction, it's not the best time for a reverse because we're not really absorbing that food as best we can. It might exacerbate what's going on with your bowel movements and, um, you know, potentially, just kind of compounds and creates more variables. So if you're able to hold steady, if it's not too much stress on the body in terms of where your current energy intake is, you can kind of hold that steady in a little bit of a holding pattern, work on some of your other variables. And then if that becomes a problem, I might try to keep energy intake relatively equivalent, but makes food substitutions based on those common irritants or the complaints of that individual, um, knowing that certain things may kind of exacerbate something like a gut dysbiosis and things like that. So um, I don't know if that was best kind of way you want to address that question, or you're assuming like, Hey, this is resolved. Now we're going to push the fat loss phase a little bit more. Um, I wasn't sure if you were kind of saying like, Oh, this person still has the gut stuff going on. What are you doing with training? Uh, but that's just kind of holistically maybe more where I would go with that. If you yeah. had like a deadline of some sort, usually, right. If someone's having GI issues pretty bad, um, it's going to impact their physical appearance in their progress photos. So if you had a competitor, like they're just not going to look their best on show day, if they're, if, if you don't really get that managed. So in that case, right, maybe it's picking a, a different timeline or a different event or different competition so that, you know, that person can actually best represent their physique. I think if it's a lifestyle client, you know, we're not working on that sort of timeline. It does open up the possibilities a little bit, which is where I mentioned kind of like, let's keep food maybe around maintenance, not push super high or super low, maybe make some food rotation or elimination and then use additional supplements as needed if it doesn't resolve after going through your basics as far as stuff that people don't really respond super well to um, or you know, as far as like what we know of from like a common irritants perspective. That could be nightshades. Uh, for some folks, gluten and dairy, soy. Uh, you know, I'm, I've mentioned cruciferous vegetables a couple of times, just depending on the person and how they're doing with FODMAPs and stuff. But uh, obviously we're not trying to go on that type of diet forever. We're just doing it temporarily to alleviate some of their symptoms and hopefully bring things back into homeostasis. Yeah, no, that's, that was part of it. And just trying to bring this back to the, the that right when you are having like a gut issue, thyroid issue, that you don't need to jump into the most advanced gut thyroid supplementation program because as a lot of people, it's like, well, what supplement do I take is the first go-to. 
but really it's the, the, the keep it simple, stupid approach, almost like, yeah, Hey, yeah. let's look at your nutrition. Let's manage sleep stress for a lot of people. That's going to fix a lot of the issues. Then it kind of progresses from there on an, on an individual needs basis until you're going to arrive someone that needs to do more of an elimination diet, or maybe you're working on a few of those things at the same time. Um, and I wanted to bring this up because I'm sure you have some pretty advanced cases where you you do everything. There's still like these chronic issues that have occurred in the background for so long. Um, as far as is there any advanced testing that you do for these people that have these chronic gut issues that give you some good insight in how to handle them? GI mapping or that's, anything? Yeah, that's tough, on? man. I So I do use them from time to time. I'm not, you know, my confidence in testing probably starts with number one, serum labs. Number two, uh, I do think we're starting to rack up some decent evidence on things like a Dutch test, uh, especially if you if you are able to control your variables and compare side by side, head to head. Let's say you have like your serum values for that client, you can compare. I think that has some value for like your PCOS, perimenopause, or maybe someone who's struggling with like a female HRT case. I think it's a little more niche. Um, serum labs are by far my favorite. I think the gold standard. GI map and 16 PCR. Uh, we actually just made a bunch of content on this for our students. So with PCR, um, my understanding is based on a lot of the research and what they're doing in labs they are using an 18 PCR versus a 16 PCR, the 16 PCR and just PCR in general, as we've seen with uh, some of the Rona issues over the past couple of years, uh, they can have false positives. So with your gut health, if you're not looking at biofeedback and you're just, I don't like when coaches, I'm using air quotes, treat a test. I don't think it's appropriate. You need to have conversations with the client about how the client's feeling, their symptoms. I would rather look at your food log, a Bristol stool chart, your biofeedback and your serum labs before we go order that, just in my opinion. I think for some cases, it can help provide an additional layer of data and has some value. And I'm not against it if the client is willing to do it and they have the discretionary income to order the extra test. But I think we have to be cognizant. Actually, one of my friends does a good job of kind of articulating this is like, this functional health stuff's not super functional if no one can afford it, right? And so when you start to stack up the food, the supplements, the testing, serum labs, GI, you know, even a basic GI map or GI effects, which is their competitor, we're probably looking three, 400 bucks. Yeah. Even, you know, on the pr practitioner side, maybe you can get a little bit cheaper, but uh, I think you can use it. Uh, I'll look at different things in terms of, you know, maybe your IgG or just a general state of dysbiosis. I'm looking more for patterns and trends. I think far too many people treat those GI tests like a game of operation. We actually were talking about this on a mentorship Zoom earlier. Is like if you remember when you were a kid and you had that game, it was kind of the board game operation. You could go in with like pinpoint precision. And people think you're doing that with strains of bacteria. And that's just not how. The body works, nor is our understanding of the microbiome at that level to support that type of intervention. Uh, there's just, we don't have the evidence or even from a clinical and anecdotal perspective, right? I think, what is that really showing you? It's showing you, okay, we may have a general state of imbalance or dysbiosis, may have some inflammation here. What does that bring you back to? It brings you back to that protocol of food removal, potential supplementation. Insane. We do have evidence on antimicrobials that, hey, you know, maybe I'm going to use some oil of oregano, olive leaf, thyme, berberine, et cetera. Maybe I'm using some complementary alternative medicine or Eastern medicine as opposed to an antibiotic and Western medicine that's kind of going to nuke stuff. We do have uh, RCTs on that to look at those antimicrobials relative to uh, antibiotics. But I don't, I don't know necessarily that, you know, my preference would be, okay, someone tries the supplement and diet route first. Um, I, I do, and I'm not, I don't want it to seem like I'm hating on these tests because it's wonderful that from a like free market perspective, right? In more of like a capitalism society, these private industry entities are striving to make a test to identify something that can help people who are really struggling with their health. I love that hundred percent. I think that's fantastic. I love that we're getting tests in this area. And I think the microbiome is kind of this like unexplored frontier, right? Compared to serum labs. So I think it's cool that we have the 16 PCR, GI map, GI FX, et cetera. But also being on the inside of the industry, I have seen some things where maybe people are submitting tests, um, like random samples, or it's the same sample with different names on it, sending it to the same testing company and getting different results. And that type of thing, you know, if I were like quoting Peter Griffin, you know, that's going to like grind my gears from a family guy perspective. It's just like that, that type of issue in terms of the level of control and accuracy that would concern me. So I think if you're a coach and you want to use those things, use it as pattern identification, 
trend analysis, use it as part of your critical thinking and your toolkit. Don't just look at that piece of paper and think, okay, well, if I do X, then that automatically means Y. And this is automatically going to solve that problem. Because I've seen so many people where they follow. Also, the problem with those tests is they give you essentially a printout of suggested recommendations that are standardized. They're not customized to the individual. So they can be very valuable from a data aggregation, like accrual perspective. However, I don't necessarily agree with like the widespread recommendations that come with those tests as part of like your PDF packet that you get. I don't think stool culture is very strong. Uh, I would generally avoid those just culture-based tests. PCR is a little bit better. Uh, I want to say the other two we're moving into are like, it's like metabol meta, uh, metagenomics, metatranscriptonomics. And I think there's like a metabolomics. There's like three uh, that start with more of that phrasing. And uh, it's an area I'm researching more that I think we should have more data on in the next few years. Um, right now, PCR does appear to be better than the stool culture. And then from a raw data perspective, um, just one of the PhD MD researchers that I follow on the gut health side, she's used some of the thorn raw data before from their, their gut test. Um, it's not super easy for clients to read. And if you don't know a lot about the raw data on like the gut microbiome might not be super helpful. Um, and so that leaves you kind of with the PCR side, which is like your Genova GI effects and your diagnostic solutions GI map, which they're a tool in your tool belt. It is not the only tool uh, that you need to show up with on the job site. And I think that would be my biggest uh, you know, recommendation for anyone out there, whether you're a competitor or a coach. I love the data. I love the fact that we're pushing to have more information for people. I'm just hesitant to put all my eggs in that basket right now. Yeah, I ask because I see a lot out there about do this GI map and here's your GI protocol. And we're going to address this one specific strain. It's like, wow, that we really don't know that much about the microbiota and especially even what the test would even mean. So I, I think it goes back to your great point, Sam, but basically you're treating a person in front of you and not a lab number. And there's a lot we can get with just having a relationship with our client and pulling off the biofeedback, working on some basic big picture levers to, to address first before you go way down the rabbit hole as your, your first approach to go. So yeah. I mean, if they've had longstanding issues, I think it has its place and maybe it's an additional data point. I sure. just don't like when it's like you barely even know this person and you're you're like making all of your assumptions based off of that. That's I think when I have a strong opinion about it, that's generally what I'm trying to discourage. I'm not anti, I love testing. I think it's great. If you have a client that wants to experiment and do more testing, it's fantastic. And also by more of us doing that in the coaching space, we create a larger pool of data to make an informed decision based off of as an industry to responsibly coach people. Um, so I'm very, very pro testing. And I already you know, know I feel that way. I feel very confident in Serum Labs. And I think these other two or three kind of realms, you know, even things like uh, I think, you know, potentially like organic acids tests and other things can have their place. Um, maybe someone who's dealing with some gut brain stuff or uh, mycotoxins or something. There's, there's probably niche considerations where these things can be powerful and great. And I think we're getting more information, but as of right now, serum labs are the gold standard. And if you are going to do one of those other tests, just please communicate with the person in front of you. And rather than just looking at the number that's on the piece of paper. Uh, and then when you do go and make your protocol, make it customized and individualized to the person, not just whatever spit out uh, from that data set. So I think we're all pretty aligned to see you guys kind of nodding along yeah. on the podcast as far as like, that's kind of where we're at right now. I just, I would hate for someone to, you know, completely base like their entire life and nutrition off of something where, yeah, I mean, we're decently confident, but I don't think it's like without, you know, a shadow of a doubt. And, and people who are saying that, I think are a lot of the folks who are making significant financial compensation off of those tests and the supplements. Um, and, and that's a significant part of their coaching practice. And there's nothing, obviously nothing wrong if you align with a company that you believe in and you think it's helping people. But I do think some folks are pushing tests and supplements more so because as part of their compensation structure and how they run their practice, um, it's built in kind of that economic and financial component which uh, creates a degree of bias that then impacts their decision-making. Yeah. Well, Sam, you are a wealth of information on this. And um, I know we're coming up a little over an hour, but for, for more coaches that want to learn from you or just athletes or lifestyle clients, um, where can they follow you along and get more information about what you provide? Sure, man. Uh, I appreciate you having me on today. So I'm Samuel Science on all platforms. So Instagram, uh, my podcast is Samuel Science. Website is samularscience.com. Uh, I run uh, the Functional Nutrition and Metabolism Specialization Program for Coaches, which I link 
typically in my bios, as well as that podcast website, et cetera. Uh, we will have a separate metabolism school domain set up. If you are a little bit on the more uh, intermediate side of things, you're trying to grasp some of this knowledge in a more simple way than the level of depth we went into on the podcast today. I will have a book coming out this fall on Amazon called Metabolism Made Simple. Um, you know, it's making sense of nutrition to transform your metabolic health. So uh, if you find yourself where you were in between the weeds conversation and kind of that uh, super beginner, which I'm assuming most of the people listening to this podcast are there, uh, that might be a great resource for them as well, but post tons of content on social and typically three podcasts a week is one of the places I hang out the most. Um, so hopefully that adds value for your listeners. Uh, cause I think that's how Luke found me as well is just through the free content. Uh, so always trying to share that knowledge and help you guys kind of level up in your transformation. Well, thank you, Sam, for everything you do. And I'll put all those links in the show notes below for anyone that wants to reach out. Thanks again for coming on. This is J3U podcast and we'll talk to y'all next time.